The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of WLMB TV 40 Toledo. This opioid crisis is, is just out of control uh, and it continues to rage. Um, and so that's most of it. But what most people don't understand is very, very few of these cases involve a prescription. Another episode of Main Street, the fastest half hour in television. I'm Dr. Jamie Schmitz. Of course, I'm joined by my co-host for the past 21 years, Virginia Bosse. Well, Jamie, it is great to be here. I'm looking forward to today's show. We have with us Dr. Robert Forney. He's the chief toxicologist from the office of the Lucas County Coroner. And so we're going to be talking about um, you know, the opioid epidemic. And he was here with us a few years ago, so he's going to give us an update, but also how the pandemic has impacted his office as well. So uh, uh, Dr. Forney, Welcome back. We're uh, thrilled to have you here. It's good to we be are here. thrilled to have you here, Dr. Forney. So, uh, Dr. Forney, uh, it's been a few years since you've been with us. I'm sure a lot of things have changed and maybe some things have remained exactly the same. But would you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do as the chief toxicologist for Lucas County? Sure. Well, I am uh, a very happily married man. Uh, I was 41 when I married because of my medical training. Uh, we, my wife Debbie is a beautiful, she's my beautiful blonde. Wonderful. Uh, we have five adult children. Uh, two of the two oldest are married. Uh, my oldest son is a um, combat certified uh, Black Hawk pilot. Oh, wow. Uh, working in Southern California. Uh, my daughter is a speech pathologist and she's in Idaho. Interesting. And then uh, the other three boys uh, are here in, in Toledo, where we live. Um, how, long you, how long have you been the chief toxicologist for Lucas I came. County? I came here in 1976. Wow. And I, uh, at that time, my office was in the medical school. I've been on the faculty of the medical school since that time. Uh, and um, uh, the the coroner didn't have a building at that time. So I was both on the faculty teaching in the medical school and doing forensic toxicology, that is the coroner's toxicology. We're interested in the cause and manner of death. And so my role is, uh, are drugs involved? And if so, how? Most of the time that means a, a toxicity, but it also could include someone who has uh, a stroke or a heart attack because they were not taking the drugs that they should have been. Taking. Yeah, and as you were saying earlier, you know, uh, for our viewers, you know, in Lucas County, uh, if there's a certain criterion that's met, um, you would be the chief toxicologist would be over that autopsy. Yes. Yeah, and certifying, you know, what the cause of death was. Is that kind of well? What the dep the deputy coroner actually makes the ruling. Makes that ruling. Makes the ruling. But I, I write it when the, when drugs are involved. I write opinions that basically uh, they're they're very kind to accept my opinions. Right, you've been doing it a while. I've been doing <laughs> Not it. Not your first rodeo. Uh, that's right. So what are some of the primary drug issues you see facing the Toledo area? Well, this opioid crisis is, is just out of control uh, and it continues to rage. Um, and so that's most of it. But what most people don't understand is very, very few of these cases involve a prescription uh, pain reliever. It's almost all street uh, opioids and they involve multiple drugs. Uh, I signed out a case uh, yesterday that had 16 different drugs. Wow. And so uh, these are, there are, there are some that are medical, but very few. Most of them, they're just drug users. Long ago, all all of them were, uh, we called them narcotics. Uh, they were opiates. Uh, and an opiate is an, an opioid from a plant, from the poppy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's morphine, codeine, and thebane. Those are the opiates. Then we started having synthetic 
drugs that work at the same receptors. Uh, one of the early ones of those was hydrocodone uh, and uh, Vicodin. Mm -hmm. So to embrace the, the synthetics are not opiates, but the opiates plus the synthetics are opioids. So synthetics are something that has been created by man's hand. Correct. Where op 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 opioids have really come from a plant-based. Right. Okay, I got you. And it's improving. I mean, the pharmaceutical companies try to improve on morphine to make it more effective. For example, morphine is not absorbed very well, so it has to be given IV. So we have the synthetics that will you can take orally. Yeah. That would be an example of an improvement. So prescribed opioids yes. and synthetics, you know, can be very helpful in, you know, medical, you know, helping people, you know, maybe overcome medical procedures and, and pain, but, uh, but there's really a lot of abuse that happens illegally. Yeah. And uh, could you describe that a little bit? Yes. Well, the, the issue is, uh, you know, pain management. Uh, and when they are properly prescribed and properly taken, a big change occurred um, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when it was decided that pain was a vital sign. So you go to the doctor and, and you know, you, you have pain, what, how do you rate it on a scale of one to 10? And so what started happening is outpatient opioids. See, before, almost all the opioid was in the hospital, often post-surgery. And very highly controlled. Very controlled and very short. You know, maybe after the second day, you'd be moved off the opioid onto something like uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen, or maybe ibuprofen or something like that and discharge. You know, the, the pain comes back sooner than they're supposed to take the drug. And so they, they take the drugs, so they run out of their prescription. So they go to the pharmacy and the pharmacy says, I'm sorry, you, we can't refill it for another week. And then they go to the street. So that, the early days, that's kind of what pushed it. Okay. So, um, so it was a seismic to, shift 10, 15 years ago. Right. Now yeah. it's people, many of them, most of them are, are men. Um, they started smoking marijuana in middle school. They like getting high they find that there's better drugs than marijuana for getting high. So marijuana is what, what they call a gateway drug for a lot yeah, of people? Yeah, right. And, you know, tobacco is to a certain extent as well, and um, alcohol. Um, but people who enjoy getting high, and opioids are very effective, you know, the pleasure that's possible from, from an opiate high, which tends to be a higher dose than, than the analgesic dose, the pain dose. Well, now we know that the opioids, you know, it's created a, an epidemic, you know. Um, so how has that changed over the years? Well, the drugs have changed. Uh, in the early days, uh, it was heroin, and then it, uh, but it's moved to fentanyl, and now it's almost all fentanyl. Uh, in, 20, uh, in 2016 and 17 and early 18, we had uh, analogs. An analog is, uh, fentanyl structure, but then some other functional groups added on to it. And so, uh, but that's diminished. We're, we're back to, it's almost all fentanyl now, and many other drugs. Uh, methamphetamine is, has become very big in this community. So a lot of the fentanyl deaths also have methamphetamine or cocaine. A lot of them have marijuana. They have Xanax. They have lots of different things. Yeah. Now, Dr. Forney, uh, if we could bring that slide back up. Uh, you brought this illustration. Yes. Uh, we're going to bring that full screen so our viewers can read that at yeah. home, but would you describe what you're illustrating here in this uh, photograph? Well, heroin is much more potent. That means it takes less of it than, than morphine. Uh, fentanyl is a hundred times more potent than heroin. And the, and the analogs are even more potent than fentanyl. Carfentanyl is, uh, you just can't imagine how little it takes to be lethal. Uh, and the people that are, are buying these drugs on this, they don't know what they're getting. You know, a lot of them think it's heroin, but it's really fentanyl. Or they'll buy fentanyl, but it's really carfentanyl, or acetylfentanyl, or cyclofentanyl, or, I mean, there's a whole list of these analogs.
and this is really the source of they're buying illegal drugs on the street yes but this is the source and when i look at this picture i'm just shocked because there's almost nothing in that vial right and uh fentanyl you know there's a few specks there care fentanyl there's almost nothing in the vial right, right. and yet people are taking this it's mixed in with the illegal drugs that they're buying and they end up in your office, don't they? Yeah. And what are the st statistics that you're seeing these days? Well, you know, there's been reports that this thing is flattening. It's not flattening. Um, it's increasing. Uh, year over year, uh, I think I brought a graph, uh, the, uh, the numbers are just going up. Uh, 20, in 2019, we had 452 Oh, there we go. Uh, deaths and you know 433 the year before and so on. You go back to 2010 and we had eight. Wow. Eight. Eight. And now we're up to 452. What a difference right. a decade can make. Right. Wow. And if and if you look at the graph, Lucas County. And that's just Lucas is County. The, no, no. That no. No. 452 is the 21 counties we serve in Northwest Ohio. I understand. But most of them are Lucas. Yeah. If you look at the blue line, the blue line is Lucas. That's 265 right. of the 452. Right. A shocking number. Right. And you look at the slope of those, and for 2020, I'll tell you, it's going to be up again. Yeah. And that's just opioid it's, deaths. It's like, we're, it's, we're not just talking deaths. It's like all we do. Yeah. Right. And when our viewers are saying this is like 75, 80% of our deaths are opioid deaths. Wow. Or, or combined drug deaths mm -hmm. with involving opiates. 75 to 80% what you do we, on any we, given day? We acquired... We acquired a, a semi-trailer refrigerated for the COVID crisis. We're using it for the opioid crisis. We don't get that many COVID deaths in our office. And so our, our ability to, to store uh, deaths uh, exceeds our ability because of the opioid crisis. So you were telling us earlier in the green room that you have a space that's permanent. How many does that hold? And then how many does this extra refrigerated refrigerated trailer that you've purchased, uh, how many does that hold and how's that work? Okay, well the room holds 28 on okay. gurneys and the trailer about 32. But most of those are being used because of opioid Opioids. addiction. Mm -hmm. Which is not to say that the COVID crisis isn't important. It is. Yeah. But, um, but this opioid thing is, I mean, it's been pushed off the front page, and yet it still uh, rages. Well, speaking of the pandemic and the opioid crisis, well, we are not done with this conversation. And so we're going to continue it and talk about how the opioid epidemic is changing in our current environment when we come back. And so the idea of a mask is to reduce aerosols. It's a respiratory thing. And so the, the air coming out of our, our nose and mouth is what will carry the virus. And the idea of the mask is to reduce that. We're here with Dr. Robert Forney, Jr. He's the chief toxicologist from the Lucas County Coroner's Office. And we've been talking about the opioid epidemic and you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic as well. So how do you see the, um, the opioid epidemic changing in our current environment? Well, it's increasing. Uh, it really hasn't changed uh, much except that there's more deaths. Right, and we like saw that graph a little bit ago, yes. and you just you just see that uh, continuing to go up. Uh, so, you you also earlier had talked about um, how this is really impacting males, white males. Yes. Maybe why do you think that white males are so at risk? Well, most of these men are are not uh, living lives that I certainly lived uh, that was common uh, 50 years ago. Um, they mostly come from broken homes. Uh, they're unmarried. Uh, they're in their uh, 30s and 40s. They're mostly white. Um, and they're sexually active, but marriage isn't uh, necessary. Um, my wife and I, uh, I date my wife. And we go out and we, we meet people in restaurants and whatever, and they talk about their, quote, love lives, but they're not married. They have no intention of getting married, you know, and so we're we're creating all these uh, single parent uh, families, and and many of these men that's the way they grew up, and they don't really understand manhood or or what God intended uh, for us, and so they're they're finding 
pleasure in all the wrong places. And uh, it's, it's really a sad thing. It's a breakdown of the family. Yeah. And why do you think there is this breakdown of the family that's happened over the last 30, 40 years? Well, it's kind you of know, a theological the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's sin. I mean, <laughs> the, the, what else can you tell us, right? <laughs> right. Well, no. I mean, it beca- you know, it started in the '60s with the, you know, birth control, and uh, it no longer became necessary to remain pure. You know, make love, not war. You know, and um, it's, it's it has not been good for the people involved. You know, they think they're free, but they find, find out that they're actually in bondage because that's what sin does. It, it puts us in bondage. Yeah, and it just leaves them looking for a higher high, and the highest high right. out there yeah. are opioids. That's right. Very good. Right. Um, let's shift gears just a little yeah. bit, and uh, let me ask you this. How are SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 cases being handled by the coroner's office? Um, and what is SARS-CoV-2? What is COVID-19? Okay. Well, first of all, SARS-CoV-2 is the, is the name of the virus. COVID is the name of the disease that the virus causes. Okay. COVID-19 is because it, it emerged in 2019. So it's a disease, COVID, coronavirus disease 19 is a 2019 disease now the the SARS-CoV-2 is a, is a coronavirus uh, SARS S A R S is sudden acute respiratory syndrome uh, and so the the coron- there are many coronaviruses the common cold is a coronavirus uh, corona uh, the word corona comes i think maybe there's a graphic the, the word corona comes because under an electron microscope, which is very high power to be able, these are very tiny, tiny things. Mm-hmm. They have a corona. Kind of like the photograph. Yes. And so that crown or corona is what is typical of all these viruses. So these, these and a virus has got genetic material in it. Uh, it's different than a bacteria. Uh, So the common cold, for example, is a coronavirus. Most coronaviruses are uncomfortable but not dangerous. This this SARS-CoV-2, coronavirus 2, is dangerous. It's it's lethal in many people, especially the elderly and those with what we call comorbidities. A morbidity is an illness. Uh, So a comorbidity means that uh, when someone who already has an illness becomes ill with the COVID uh, and gets the COVID disease, uh, that's when it's real dangerous. Well, what do you say to the person that says, oh, COVID-19, covid schmovid you know, it's just like the common cold. How would you say that's, well, it's not, not. that's not accurate? No, it's, no, it's not. Um, especially, uh, there's something called the cytokines. A cytokine is part of the immune response to disease. And this virus is able in some individuals, typically those with a weakened immune system, is able to create what's called a cytokine storm, a huge release of these cytokines, and these cytokines are are damaging to tissues. So people that are at risk are especially people that are immunocompromised. Uh, For example, people who have a disease that compromises them, or uh, people that are on uh, chemotherapy. Uh, my, uh, my son uh, is dating a girl who's 23 years old and has breast cancer, and she's being treated with uh, chemotherapy, and so she's immunocompromised. Um, people that have respiratory disease, a lot of the deaths are people who were smokers, uh, who have respiratory disease as a result of having been smokers. Interesting. Um, heart disease, uh, any of those. So if you're in that situation and you get this COVID, it can be very dangerous. And the problem is what most young people are, are asymptomatic. Yeah. But and even though they're asymptomatic, they can still infect someone else. Yeah. Let me circle around um, back to the first part of my question. How has that affected COVID-19 affected uh, the Lucas County Coroner's office, your office that you work okay. at? 
Well, we follow the CDC guidelines. Uh, everyone does, but coroners do. Uh, and those guidelines are that, that, these, uh, that autopsies not be done. When we do an autopsy, we, we cut open the body and there are, there's blood and the possibility of aerosols everywhere. And so, so CDC said, let's not do autopsies on those that are proven to be COVID. And so this is, this is what we do. Now we still take authority. We still do cause of death. Um, but many of these COVID deaths will go right to the a funeral home. Now we have body bags that are double layered. The inside layer is a clear material and the outer is not. And so you can open the outer and you can identify people by their facial characteristics or tattoos or whatever sure. without uh, exposing the environment. Well, we use those anyway. You know, people die with pathogens, with infectious disease all the time they have, you know, and so it's always true that we are very careful. Uh, every day, every day, the autopsy suite is, is clean with bleach. It's washed down and, and cleaned, and we treat everything with, uh, w very cautiously. Uh, there's personal protective equipment on the people involved in the autopsy, et cetera. Uh, but uh, with this, uh, not every infectious disease that we might be exposed to is, can be as lethal as this is, and we want, don't want to take it home to our families. And so we, we, are, uh, we are using an in enhancement of, of our personal protective equipment, or PPE. Um, we, uh, we test. Some are, are already tested. We know they're COVID. They've been proven COVID and they die. They're just going to get an inspection that, that is looking for trauma, looking for anything uh, unusual, like someone doing something to them. And we look at medical records, et cetera, and then sign it out. We have some that we suspect might be COVID that have not been tested. We test them. And so they, they, they remain in, in our refrigerated room uh, until the test results come back. Uh, and if they're, if they're positive, then they're COVID and uh, we do an inspection. If they're not positive, then we, do the, we go ahead and do the autopsy. Well, you know, talking about safety measures and taking precautions, you know, how effective uh, you know, are masks? Well, you know, the, the whole issue, anything, with a cold, anything, it's about dose. It, it's not that one virus is able to cause someone to be sick. Uh, I'm told by infectious disease uh, specialists that it takes about a thousand uh, with the COVID, with the SARS-CoV-2 to, to infect someone. And so the idea of a mask is to reduce aerosols. It's a respiratory thing. And so the, the air coming out of our, our nose and mouth is what will carry the virus. And the idea of the mask is to reduce that. But honestly, <laughs> one has to ask oneself, well, then why do some people wear a hood over a mask? And it's because most masks have all kinds of uh, methods all, all of escape. All masks are not created equal. No. Yeah. And, and in fact, even N95 masks, which, which is the, the best kind, uh, there's more than one kind of those. Uh, and uh, the, the best for those, for example, nurses who are taking care of COVID patients who are real close, they fit against their face. A friend of mine is a nurse who takes care of COVID patients at Bay Park, and he had a full beard. He shaved the beard completely so that the mask would fit not just better with a nose thing, but it's actually sealed on, on his face. And that is tested by spraying a perfume uh, to see if, uh, if he can smell it or uh, go the other way uh, inside his uh, mouth. Then the mask is put on to see if someone outside can smell it. So th these are serious masks. So that's why the CDC recommends, and everybody should understand, wearing a mask doesn't protect you. I mean, it's better, it's reducing the dose, 
you still want to practice distancing, even, you know, even with the mask. And, and honestly, when we see a number of people wearing masks, they're so loose, you know, okay, it's, it's helpful, you know, but uh, probably wh what you're doing is you're wearing it for someone else, not for yourself. Sure. And it's about reducing the dose, especially if you happen to cough and you happen to have the disease. Yeah. Well, and there's this two-week lag period. Yeah. You become infected and you don't know you have it for a couple of weeks. And so that's, that, again, is where this issue comes. Well, thank you for sharing on that topic. Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're just about out of time here, but how would you encourage people today, you know, during these uncertain times? Well, I think, you know, trust the Lord. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 7 makes it clear, you know, we all know about humble yourself and pray and turn from your wicked ways and I will heal the land. But the first part of that is, you know, God's in control. You know, he claims to be responsible for sending disease, right? And so God is in control of this and we do need to humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways. And you know, we get serious, more serious about our faith. And I think the most important thing is rejoice in the Lord always. We have a great Savior and we, we should be loving our neighbors. That means sharing the gospel, but we like to take food and, and uh, uh, be of help as we can. This is a great opportunity for the church to really be a bright light shining, to show the hope that we have in Christ, that we're not afraid and uh, that's, well, Dr. Forney, uh, I do call it the fastest half hour in television. We are out of time, but uh, you won't wait several years to come back and visit us I again. Won't. Will you visit us on Main Street I, again? I will. I'd be more than happy. Thank you so much. I'm for sure our viewers will enjoy the next time they see you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you for joining us today on Main Street. Be sure to join us next week for another great episode. We hope that Main Street has been a blessing to you today. Please feel free to contact the following to learn more about the topics discussed on today's show. WLMB would like to thank all the faithful supporters of WLMB that make this program possible.